What ails contemporary Muslims? Before I begin, I must define the words that I am using in the title of this thought stream. What is used in its inquisitive form, not in its descriptive or prescriptive form. Ails is used in the sense that there is something bothering a set of people, not as in something that is wrong with them. Contemporary is being used rather loosely here. I am trying not just to look at the post-911 world, but perhaps at the world few or several decades, even centuries before that momentous event. Muslims here does not refer merely to those that subscribe to a particular brand of Islam, but to all those that were brought up in a family professing Islam, irrespective of their current state of faith. So first, does something ail contemporary Muslims? Is something bothering them? The answer is probably in the affirmative. I am not aware of any systematic study that has come to this conclusion. But why not ask the Muslims themselves? Anecdotally, I can say with a reasonably high degree of confidence that a large number of Muslims do think that something is bothering them. So what is that? Well, the world itself. It insists on doing things that they do not like. The world, on the other hand, thinks that the problem lies with the Muslims themselves. Many people that sit on this side of the argument believe they know the exact problem too. Islam. They believe that Islam is the main problem with Muslims. So how does one settle this disagreement? It may be that there is no reason why otherwise sane people blow themselves up save the fact that they are inflicted by that ultimate unmitigated evil called Islam. Alternatively, it may be that Muslims are the only good people that God has sent on earth and it is their job to root out evils that are practiced by the enemies of God. And the bad people are not only not allowing them to do that, but are also bringing the war inside their own home. Simply put, the pro-Islam group says, Islam is in danger. The anti-Islam group insists, Islam is the danger. Which version is correct? Or is the truth something altogether different? Well. On the world front, not everyone believes in the extreme hypotheses outlined above. A lot of people have suggested a lot of other possibilities, including some that broadly agree with the Muslims that the real aggressor lies west of Mecca. Interestingly, from the Muslims' front, the compliment is not returned. In fact, there isn't any noteworthy hypothesis other than that evergreen pet, Islam is in danger. Why so? Is it really that none of the Muslims have any imagination? Or could it be that the Muslims can imagine as well as any other people, but have only rarely had the courage to speak their mind? The outspoken Muslims are only those that toe the anti-West line, or those apostates that are now completely anti-Islam. Where are the other voices? Where are the dissenters, the mavericks, the eccentrics of Islam? It is not as if they were never there. Where is the contemporary Mansur, the Sarmad of the day, the Nizamuddin that Muslims need today? Why is it that while the world at large gives us a variety of songs, sometimes harmonic, at other times cacophonic, but from the Muslim world all that ever emerges is a chorus? True, a chorus is easier to execute. True, it often sounds good too. But what good is it? even to the singers if it throttles their creativity. True, uniformity has its great uses, but is it more useful than diversity? Can it ever be? Those of us that value uniformity above diversity are often in the majority. Uniformity is the bulwark of a society, but we must not forget that unless tempered by diversity, this bulwark can only serve to cause rigor mortis. Any system that is incapable of renewing itself with new ideas ceases to be a living system. Those of us who treasure uniformity over diversity must get cosmetic surgery done to make all our fingers of the same length and make sure none of them is opposable. We must paint all our life in a single shade of grey, eschewing all colour. We must also give up all sexual reproduction and insist on cloning as the only legal way of creating new human beings. The list goes endlessly on. Largely, all those who do think, and many who do not, 
regard freedom of expression very close to their heart they know that all progress in human civilization has come about only because some people chose to think outside of the box human progress the good as well as the evil is really owed to our eccentrics our mavericks our dissenters the ones who complained instead of complying no one who ever thinks only what others think no one who speaks only what others speak can ever by definition come up with something new something heterodox something that can make love to the reigning ideas and produce a new paradigm a more valid one in the changed circumstances if muslims really love their faith they must not insist on a simplistic interpretation of a few verses of the quran to claim that everything critical in life was frozen 14 centuries ago even the quran itself abrogated several of its commandments during the short course of its 23 year revelation how then can a specific interpretation be valid for all time is the interpretation more sacred than the sacred book itself the most damaging parts of this interpretation are possibly those which insist based on two little verses in quran that there is no room for change islam was perfected and the messenger of allah was the seal of prophets this centuries old interpretation fails to place the two revelations in context the former in that of the kinds of meat prohibited the latter permitting the messenger to marry his adopted son zaid's ex-wife zainab now one can appreciate the muslims need to take the quran to be god's word for all time because such is the conception of god however why must it not be reinterpreted in the light of vastly increased knowledge of the adherents of islam today muslims have no problems with reaping the other benefits that have come along with that increased knowledge why should they not benefit in the area of interpretation of god's word too further quran is a book of a particular size how can it have explicitly stated all rules for all people in all civilizations for all times to come this inability to read the quran in any but the most literal manner has resulted in several illogical practices in muslim cultures some opiates are known to be worse than alcohol in impairment of human faculties tobacco is known to be much worse for health yet the muslim religious taboo continues to be mainly alcohol the injunctions against usury which have a certain function in the hard currency regime only serve to hurt the muslim community in the day of central banks and fully floating fiat currencies where are the people that can challenge this interpretational habit which views all change as evil why must this function of interpreting the scripture be left only to the ulama the very people who have a vested interest in ensuring that their pronouncements are taken as the only valid ones when will muslims find the good sense and courage to break the stranglehold of cast and stone brokers on their relationship with their god isn't islam supposed to be iconoclastic religion is too important to be left to the religious to those whose business is religion who earn their livelihood through religion or those who get their social status primarily through religion it is the rest who call themselves muslims or friends of muslims who must help the muslims reassert their birthright and shoulder their prime responsibility to define for themselves what life means they do their own living not leave it for the brokers so how can they leave the most crucial part the definition of their life for them muslims have become so accustomed to living in a box and being rendered by a cookie cutter that they find it close to impossible to allow any space to those very dissenters mavericks and eccentrics who could have and can still give islam a new lease of life where does this leave a thinking muslim he has either to think only of matters other than the most critical matters of life or give up islam altogether is that what muslims want for their future whose responsibility is it to change the state of affairs the ulama will stay away from anything that reduces their importance politicians will never do anything that loses them even one vote the unthinking will find it easier to call for the death of anyone suggesting change rather than actually contemplate it like it or not the responsibility of change rests with the muslim common man who thinks he must tell himself and the other muslims lose the cookie cutter please